they got their singles totally crossed here because the Empress is running and he's passing regular singles and the Sorostads, he, he was more into the fog than the Empress was, so he's passing fog singles. Let's move off to the Empress of Ireland, the tragedy that happened at the mouth, or near the mouth of the St. Lawrence Seaway Channel on May 29th, 1914, just two years after the Titanic went down. British built ship, beautiful ship, uh, owned by the Canadian Pacific Railway. This was, for its time, a pretty big boat, 570 feet long, twin screw, so which was pretty cool for back in the day. You could forward one engine and reverse the, the other to give it more maneuverability. 1,477 people on board that day, most of them, 1,012 people died when it foundered in just 14 minutes. In calm water, here we go again. This would be the, and still is, the worst peacetime Maritime disaster in Canadian history. Uh, its regular route was back and forth between Quebec City, Quebec, to Liverpool, England. Uh, it carried people, passengers, back and forth across the North Atlantic. It lies in 130 feet of water. This boat was not resurrected, recovered. It's still laying there. Beyond bizarre, this story is so tragic. What what jumps out at you? Well. I've studied this pretty pretty good. Once again, you have to go. Here's uh, the book I take my information from. The store into the mist is called by Anne Renaud or whatever that is. Another one is Canada's Titanic: the history, the history of the. I like that Canada's Titanic. Yeah. Okay, here's a story. This is weird. Captain Henry George Kendall was the captain of the Henry Empress. Kendall, yeah. And Captain Thomas Anderson. Think of that name, okay. Who was on the ship that rammed them? The Storstead. The Storstead. Yeah. Now, here, here's, here, and keep in mind now, of the 138 children aboard, only four lived. The whole thing turns out to be a misunderstanding of fog singles, okay? And I'll get to that in a minute. See, when, 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 when you're on a ship, and I don't know if it's that way now, but it used to be, the captain had to be in a pilot house in the rivers, right? And you'd have a watchman on the bow of the boat. And they'd watch for this because you see the light light up and they go, you know, one whistle. And then the captain would yell back, one whistle. You know, that way everybody knew what was going on. 140, the lookout reported a ship about 10 kilometers off the right side, the starboard side of the Empress. And it was a Norwegian coal boat called the Storstad, 10,400 tons of coal. And at that moment, the fog started to roll in. I want to set the stage just a little bit more in that. Uh, so people know where we are. This ship departed from Quebec City at 4.30 p.m. So now we're getting close to 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so it, it didn't take long to get to the disaster, but this ship with its Captain yeah. Henry Kendall yeah. is steaming out of the St. Lawrence Seaway bound for the North Atlantic. Go ahead. The uh, Empress whistled. Now remember, they don't have radios yet. They, they had Morse code and stuff, but they didn't have like now that you just get on and talk, you know. Empress, starboard to starboard, starboard passage, two whistles. The Storstead answered back with one whistle. Mm. Okay. So two whistles means passing starboard, starboard to starboard. starboard. One whistle means port to port. So right. In other words, for the folks at home, if you're driving your car down the highway, a normal way you drive is, is, is one America. whistle. But if you go against the grain, it's two whistles. Okay. Now, here's where the, here's where the rubber hits the road. Okay. Uh, out of the fog at the last second, the uh, Empress had cut across, and the Storstead hit it at 1.55 a.m., okay? Now, before I go any further, I want to read about this fog signal so the people at home under, this is right out of the rules of the road book. A ship underway sounds one prolonged blast of its whistle or foghorn, 
not less than every two minutes. You got that? You're underway. A vessel underway but stopped sounds too prolonged blast, not less than every two minutes, with two seconds between each one. They got their singles totally crossed here because the Empress is running and he's passing regular singles and the Saurus he, he was more in the fog than the Empress was, so he's passing fog singles. And don't forget the Storstad had a reinforced bow because she's used to breaking ice up off the North Sea, see? And when they hit, it hits right between them funnels and the captain of the Empress decides, man, I got to you know, kick the engines up here and try and get us into the shallow water and beach her. Had he not done that, that store said was stuck right in there and and, and the plugged yeah, it plugged the hole. They would have had plenty of time to get the boats down and save. But when he went ahead, that source that got pulled right out. Now you got a fifteen foot high gash and the water just poured in like crazy. And that boat sixty thousand gallons per second. And it was gone in 14 minutes. You got 14 minutes to deal with this thing. That's very little time. The uh, six minutes after the collision, the engine room was totally flooded, knocked out the power. The wireless operator was able to get off one SOS. That's Morse code for SOS. He was able to get off one before they lost all power. Now remember, nowadays you've got emergency battery backup. So this the, at 2.09 a.m., the river swallowed her up. Now, the Storstad sat right there, and they go, what, did he take off again or what? And all of a sudden, they start hearing all this screaming, literally. So he, he lowered the boats, and they, they rescued some people. But in that cold the water... The Storstad lowered its lifeboats. Lifeboats to try and save some, and did save some people. But in that ice cold water, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you're gone, man. And, and, and or less. Just, all these corpses were, they either drowned or they froze to death, one of the two, Okay. This Captain Kendall, okay, I want to tell you about him real quick. Of the Empress. Yes. Have you heard of the Crippen case? No. What'd you call it? The Crippen case. There was a guy named Dr. Harley Harvey Crippen, okay? Okay. He, he was married to this girl in London. Anyway, for whatever reason, uh, some other female caught his eye and uh, became her. she became his mistress. Well, one day he gets a hold of Scott Lennart and he says, hey, my wife's missing. I can't find her nowhere. You know, can, we, can you call it? Now he searched high and low. They did this. They did this. Meanwhile, this Dr. Crippen dude, he's going out in public with his new main squeeze here. You know, I think her stage name was Va Va Voom, you know, or something. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed to think so. <laughs> anyway. A real hottie. So he's all over the place, and they're getting ready to reopen the investigation into this missing wife. Her name was Cora. Well, he takes off with the mistress, and he books passage. The ship was the Montrose. He's going to go to America. His wife, Cora, he bumped her off and got okay. rid of her body. See? So he could go with the... Oh, aunt, he murdered her. his wife. Right. And then tried to run with his mistress. With, with Miss Vava Boom. So anyway, they're on that ship, and they had had a picture of him and this other woman in the, in the paper. He's on the Montrose. Okay. Okay. And uh, the captain's watching the people go, we just had to be looking at the paper. And he watches these two people come aboard. And they were in disguise. But he knew right now. He says, that's them. You know, doubt in my mind. Well, they're leaving it up. But he got a hold of the authorities and told them his suspicions. The, the, the guy in, case, uh, in charge of the case of Scotland Yard then got on a different ship. It was faster than the Montrose. And he got to America first. They got to America, and the pilot boat came out to get the pilot to get the, the, the pilot through the rivers and stuff. That Scotland Yard guy got on with him, and he went right to knock the door, and boom, there he is, and he arrested him. And as, there, as there they get to New York, wherever it was, he turned around to that captain, and he said, I throw a curse on you. That captain, ladies and gentlemen, none other, was Captain Henry George Kendall of the Montrose, but then he became captain of the Empress. Oh. See, ooh, I don't know. So he, he put a curse on the captain. Yeah. Because he, you know, had this guy arrested yep. who not only killed his wife, but was running with his mistress. I found that interesting. And then to have, after all this, after all this happened, the, the, as bad as all these people dying, and could you imagine going in 14, 15 minutes? The worst part of it was five minutes after that boat sank, the fog bank totally lifted, and you could see for miles. It was like the ships met 
when the fog was at its worst, almost as if it was planned that way. Well, had the stores that stayed in there, like I said, she plugged the hole, and they would have had time to get the boats down and save everybody. But when he, the captain of the Empress Kettle, you know, full ahead to beach the boat, that ripped the source dead out of there. And this gigantic hole with all them thousands of gallons of water going in there, they didn't stand a chance. Basically zero visibility. They don't know where the other one is. But without any time to spare or react, the store stand appears and it's too late to turn, to slow down, to speed up, anything. It was and the store stand rams and as you mentioned, the Storstad had a very strong reinforced hull because it was an icebreaker. It drove into that ship 20 feet deep, pierced the boiler and engine room, 60,000 gallons a second were pouring in. The, the Storstad eventually backs away from the Empress. The Empress is doomed. It has There's no hope. Captain Kendall did say, close the watertight doors because I think they could flood two compartments on the Empress and she could still float. But, you know, now ships, there are systems that can automatically, electronically in some sort, close watertight doors at the push mm -hmm. or command of a button. Back then it had to be done manually, which really became part of its demise because they didn't get to it in time. Too much water coming in yeah. and, and, and this thing <clears throat> laid over on its starboard side. When we brought the, uh, was the Bay Queen, and of course that became the Arowana Queen of Toledo, we delivered her. We were supposed to take the Canso Strait through, which is this navigable waterway that uh, kind of separates Nova Scotia. It was all froze up. So we had to go all the way around between Nova Scotia and uh, Newfoundland out there. And we got in the St. Lawrence River, and we, different pilots come out at different times. And uh, they always spoke with heavy French accents, and he said, hey, we're coming up on the Empress of Ireland's grave, and I had never heard of it before. So he, he regaled us of the story. I had never heard of it till you mentioned it yeah. last time. In the summer, spring, summer, and fall, they have a buoy that sets right, and, it's, and, and it was in 2009 they made it a official grave site, you know. By I, don't, I think it's off limits now. Here we go again. Where have we heard that one before? Mm -hmm. But yeah, there have been dives on. In fact, the Canadian, there were Canadian divers that recovered the bell from the Empress in 1964. They were diving on it right after it went down. In fact, there have been six people who have lost their lives diving on the Empress as of 2009. Now it's protected under the what they call, the Canadian government calls the Cultural Property Act, whatever that is. But I think you can't go down and pluck uh, artifacts from the Empress anymore. The inquiry started on June 16, 1914. It lasted 12 days. They called 62 witnesses. And more than 8,000 questions were asked. When it all came down, push to shove, the person that was responsible was the store stand because she was passing fog signals and the Empress was passing running signals. That's why I read you those two, two rules in the rule book, see? What I find extremely interesting, though, is, uh, okay, they ended up preparing the store stand. In fact, the store stand made it all the way back into, into port because they had watertight bulkheads, right? And they're just the bow was, was was damaged, so they were able to fix it up. And it's in March of 1917, Captain Anderson, captain of the Storstead, after it's been repaired, he's off the coast of Ireland with it, and gets torpedoed by a German U-boat. And the ship is sunk. But he survived. He survived. Interestingly, Captain Kendall was second officer on a passenger liner, the Calgarian. That ship took four torpedoes off the coast of Ireland from a German U-boat, killing 49 crew members, he survived. Kendall, Henry, Captain Henry Kendall, he survived the Empress. Right, so that's his second shipwreck right there. So not quite as many as uh, second officer Lightoller on the Titanic. Boy, I'll tell you what, think about the Titanic 1912, this is 19, the Aceland was 1915, you know, this is 1915. I mean, there's a 14, lot, lot yeah. of weird things going on here, you know. Uh, but you don't have the, that many transatlantic liners anymore. You know, people are just as easy for them to fly over there, just as easy. But when we went over that gravesite, you know, he says, okay, we got a half mile away and a quarter mile away. And th this guy just, I don't know how to describe it, you know, but you could just see him shut his eyes and saying a prayer for all those people. So we joined with just a set of prayer too, you know. Spirituality, once again, you could feel Maybe just metal, I don't know, but you, a thousand people? you got to give me a break here. 
When's the last time somebody had lost a thousand people other than the Titanic? You know, you haven't been out to see the on a river. Uh, yeah, yeah. Saint Lawrence Seaway. But that's known for its fog banks. You know, it come come and go. But there you go. Uh, Canada's Titanic is right is exactly, and uh, not too many people heard about it. But that's what we're here to do is to tell people about some of these things. You know, this is the history of it. To to ram a boat. That big, I mean, the picture of it. It was a beautiful oh, ship. Oh, beautiful boat. Beautiful ship. Oh, man. And imagine how excited those people were again to, to be there and part of that experience. And heck, they're all settled into their bunks yeah. by 2 o'clock in the morning oh, around the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's relatively perfectly calm. And the farthest thing from their mind Ugh. is the largest maritime accident in Canadian history. I mean, we're not even in the North Atlantic yet. And here comes this ship, the Storstad, in fog, rams it, T-bones, the Empress of Ireland, uh, most in the lower decks, drowned immediately. Um, within minutes, the, the, as it was leaned over to the starboard, the port lifeboats couldn't be launched. They did manage to get five starboard boats down, a sixth did capsize. A four, we're talking 14 minutes, all this is going down. And during that time, you know, with the boilers failing, the lights and power failed. Six and minutes into it. They're plunged into darkness. Well, all this panic is going on around them. In 10 minutes, it laid completely over on its starboard side. And then the eerie thing to me, one of the eerie things, is then it laid there for two minutes. And so many of the survivors were standing on the hull, you know, thinking, okay, we survived this shipwreck or whatever you want to call it. And it laid there for two minutes because they thought, well, we're on the bottom of the river. They didn't know they were in 130 feet of water. It laid there for two minutes. They think they're saved, and boom, it goes down. But now each captain blamed the other. The ultimate blame did go to the captain, Anderson of the Storstad, but it was the Empress who changed her course. That's first. correct. It looked to me like the Empress cut right across the bow of the Storstad, but... but but the, the passing of the singles, that's what was so so confusing. Because you know, one was doing passing signals and the other was doing fog there signals. There you go. There you go. Which don't got, jive. They, they don't jive. They don't jive. So that didn't work. The Titanic didn't have a lot of time, but it had a lot more time to yeah. deal with the unfolding tragedy around them. The Empress had 14 minutes. How do you direct a rescue operation, or whatever you want to call it, with, with that time frame? And maybe that's... Why, like on the Titanic, was, no, women and children first. We have time to get this done. On the Empress, maybe that's why, with a very little time they had, only four of 138 children survived. Four kids. The striking number here to me is, if you were a crew of the Empress, you had a better shot at survival on this one because 248 crew members of the 420 crew members on board the Empress survived. So if you were a kid, uh, sorry about your luck. If you're a crew member, including the captain, Kendall, you, you had a better chance of getting away well, from For one the thing, same. they're awake. Okay, they're not sleeping in their bunks. Well, so oh, okay. They're ahead of the game there, you know. But to uh, live with that the rest of your life, that's got to be a tough nut to crack there, you know. I mean, a real tough nut to crack. Mm. A thousand people, that, that's a whole... But, but the, the interesting thing to me was five minutes after it sank, the fog bag lifted. Could that have been part of that curse that that guy threw under, you know? I mean, you know, I'm not trying to say there is such a thing, but who knows, maybe there is. I don't know. This is beyond me. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's worth putting out there. It, it, it's uh, awful weird. I, I would not... Dis I don't discount things like that. You things know. happen for a reason sometimes. Things happen because of mankind's mistakes, and sometimes things happen because of divine intervention. You know, you go back to the Fitzgerald, it was a terrible, terrible storm, and there you got to East, and the you can't get much safer than tied up to the dock. I mean, if there's a bad storm, you want to be tied up in the dock, and that didn't help them. That, that's still screwed up, so. I, I thought it was interesting that the last survivor from the Empress of Ireland was a lady named Grace Hannigan. And she was one of those four kids that survived the shipwreck. She was seven years old. And I can't imagine what she could recall from that night. Wow. Uh, but she lived till May 15th, 1995. Her name was Grace Hannigan. It would have been interesting to sit down with her. One of the other children survivors, a, a, a eight-year-old girl, little Florence Lorraine Barber. She survived and lived to adulthood. There were some 
there were a lot of famous people on board or influential people. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I hate to just signal them out because every human counts and it didn't matter how much money you had. Each was a tragedy in its own right and would affect families for generations. Uh, but noteworthy was the very famous stage actors of the day, Lawrence Irving and his wife, Mabel Hackney. They were famous stage actors. They had been performing in Canada, and they were in a hurry to get home to their kids, and they didn't make it out. The captain did. Well, there you go. It's You pay your money, it takes your chances, and... Uh...